pausing the recording. Cool. All right. So I am going to kick it off. Um, so first, I want to welcome folks that are here, um, all two of you. Or David, do you have other folks in your in your screen or listening? So maybe three. <laughs> um, so I want to welcome everybody to tonight's Snakes of Philadelphia talk. Um, we're going to do a little bit of an intro to myself and Billy in just a second, but I do just want to re re reiterate that this session is being recorded so that we can use it later on as resource and content on our website, billynature.com.org. Geez, here we go. Dot org, um, which we, um, we probably will maybe, do you want to do like a screenshot of that at some point again, or do you want to just fly? Let's All just right. fly. Yeah. Cool. All right. So we'll keep referring to it so y'all know it's a resource. Um, you all are smart, uh, capable adults. So you probably know most of the Zoom etiquette by now since we've all been bombarded with it so much. So we just ask that folks do try to stay muted um, throughout the presentation. But because we're a smaller group, certainly we can remain informal and you can uh, you know, unmute to kind of um, gently, politely interrupt to ask a question or certainly use the chat feature as well. Um, so that's just some of the the, the do's and maybe do's for the meeting. Um, so we want to do a little bit of an intro to myself and Billy. So Billy, if you want to kick off um, introducing yourself and then I can follow up for sure. folks that um, probably already know us or you at yeah. least. <laughs> so I'm Billy Brown. Uh, I appear in print in Grid Magazine as Bernard Brown. Uh, I have um, been into uh, reptiles, amphibians, and snakes in particular since before I remember. Um, and uh, I have, uh, I've, I have gotten into, well, I got into looking for them in the wild in a serious way, starting probably about uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, and this is a term that we're going to throw around probably, and so I'll define it now, but herping. Um, so if the term for the study of reptiles, amphibians is herpetology, uh, and we think of birding or fishing, if you're looking for birds or fish, that uh, herping is what we say when we're going out looking for reptiles and amphibians. So I've been doing that for a while. Um, I had a blog for many years called Philly Herping, which is still out there, phillyherping.blogspot.com, I guess. Uh, and then um, in Grid Magazine. And then also I have worn a hat with the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey, um, which we'll talk more about later on. Um, and so that is those are all the ways that I've, I've come to get really passionate about the snakes of Philadelphia. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Sandy Vincenny. Um, similar to Billy, I uh, have been a lover of reptiles and particularly snakes for many, many years. That's kind of what put me where I am today um, by sort of uh, mostly career and degree. I'm an educator. So I uh, my degree is in early childhood and elementary education. So I've kind of always stayed within that world. Um, but because of such a love for animals, snakes, nature, um, I've kind of always fallen into more of the environmental education, informal education route. So I've um, taught and directed and led programs at the Philadelphia Zoo. Um, most recently was at the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education. And um, I've also within some of that time founded my own nonprofit, we'll refer to fairly often in the presentation. And you can see it on the website, it's called a Child's Inspiration Wildlife Discovery Garden. Um, so when I moved into the city, um, because of that love of nature and teaching, I bought a really small house next to uh, a nice abandoned lot slash garden and turned it into a wildlife garden um, and have since been doing a lot of outreach in the neighborhood at different green spaces and really trying to engage um, young and old alike in nature and the animals around us. So that is where I come into play in this love. And um, Billy actually has since we've kind of connected in that and we have founded the phillynature.org website to kind of be a, a bridge and a resource for folks to find out more about the nature in Philadelphia and, and learn and find resources there. Um, great. Anything else, Billy, that I missed in the intro? All right. So are you going to kick on the slideshow or would you like me to? Cool. Okay. So let me hit. Sorry, I'm on like green. Give me a second, folks. Present. Can you all see my screen fairly easily? Yes. Okay. 
The only thing I don't have, Billy, is I did not print my notes. I was going to do it side by side screen share. So are you able to just now that I'm thinking it, I'm so sorry, folks. Are you able to share and then I can pop on and share for your 20 or so slides? Does that work? Yes. So let me, okay. um, let's. Sorry. Gonna... That's okay. I'm gonna go my fault. I was screen. on vacation. It's not Billy's fault. <laughs> um, I'm going to start sharing. And I will go to. Um, Thank you. Oops. There we go. You are so helpful. Thank you, folks. And thank you, Billy. All right. So we are obviously presenting Snakes of Philadelphia one evening, all the snakes. Um, so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of go over um, some of the reptile basics um, and some snake basics. Um, we'll talk about different kinds of snakes in Philadelphia, um, sort of what to do if you see a snake or wish to snake, how to help, wish to see a snake, how to help snakes. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about maybe documentation of snakes. And then finally, we'll talk about some of the ways you can conserve um, areas around us for snakes and things like that. Um, so without further ado, we will go into some of the reptile and snake basics. So snakes are indeed reptiles. Um, they're actually one of five groups of reptiles. Um, most folks know four. Um, so obviously we have snakes. We have turtles, we have lizards, and we have crocodilians, crocodiles, alligators, um, caimans, things like that. And then the fifth one that most folks don't know about, we'll just touch on it very, very briefly, are called tuataras. Um, so tuataras are really interesting reptiles. Um, tuatara is a word that is Maori, and it means peaks on back. So they very much look like lizards, um, but very like sort of spiky, very prehistoric looking. Um, and actually, they are the last living relative of lizards that have been found 200 million years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth. So they really are almost like walking dinosaurs. You can only find them in New Zealand. Um, as I said, they look very similar to lizards. Um, but the one most fascinating thing about them, um, besides the fact that most lizards, you can kind of see the eardrum or see the hole in the head where the, where the ear is, um, they are missing that. Um, but again, more mysteriously, they, uh, they have a third eye um, and it actually has a retina, it has a lens, it has a cornea, it actually has nerves, um, but they can't see with it. So it kind of just, you know, sits on top of their head. It's not very physical like a normal eye, but it's, it's kind of up there. It's really fascinating. Um, and the only other thing that they have is they actually have a second set of upper teeth. So it sets them aside and puts them in that fifth category of reptiles aside from lizards. Um, so snakes, turtles, lizards, crocodilians, and tuataras are the five groups of reptiles. Um, so tonight, uh, one of the five we will talk about are snakes. Um, uh, so snakes, as with all reptiles, are covered in scales. Um, they shed their skin. Uh, I did bring with me um, some of my snake shed. I have tons of it. Um, but one of the fascinating things with a healthy snake from other reptiles is they do tend to shed, um, this is actually from a milk snake, in one whole piece. So I don't know. Oh gosh, you're sharing a screen, so I'm not going to be able to see it. You're going to be able to see it. And you lost your sound, Billy. Are you there? No, I didn't. I just had myself muted so I could cough. Go ahead. Awesome. You got I think we can see you now with the shed skin. Oh, wait. okay. So I did bring, this is a milk snake shed. So they do tend to shed, it's a tiny one, small milk snake in one piece. So it'll come off almost like you take off your sock at the end of the night and kind of peel it off. They'll use like a rock or another sort of hard rough surface and they'll kind of break it usually open um, by the head and then kind of just slide out of it inside out. And they actually, I don't know if this will show, will shed their eye caps and everything. You can probably, yeah, you can see it. So snakes shed skin. Um, they also produce eggs. Um, initially, we, I wanted to use the term lay eggs, but I said produce eggs because we will get into this. I think Billy is going to get into this a little bit later. Um, they can produce eggs in two ways. So they are oviviparous, which means uh, like typical egg laying animals, they will lay eggs. Um, but they also can be ovoviviparous, which means they hold the eggs internally um, and the young are born alive. 
Um, so they can produce eggs, but in two ways, we will get into that. And lastly, um, another thing that is a little bit more intriguing uh, and can be difficult to understand in reptiles is they're ectothermic, a term that you may hear more often is cold-blooded. Um, so what that means is with us as mammals, we have, uh, we are endothermic, which means we produce our own heat inside of our bodies at all times. So it's typically around 98.6 degrees, give or take, unless you have a fever, which you're able to go up because your body is heating up to fight off the virus. So we are cold. We are warm inside, no matter where we go, we go outside in the winter. You can see the hot air from your breath. Um, but our bodies internally don't cool down. Now, reptiles are the opposite. They are ectothermic. They are cold blooded. They need that heat and that warmth to bring their body temperature up. So if they go out in the cold, their bodies will cool down and their body temperature will go down, which is why you will often see them as we'll get into uh, maybe on the side of a road where it's really warm after a warm sunny day, you'll see it maybe out on a rock, out on a log near the, near the water. They have to be in that sun to get their body temperatures to warm up enough to be able to have the energy to, um, to find their food, catch their food, you know, um, eat their food. So they need to warm their bodies up. Likewise, they also may need to cool down if it's too hot. They'll pop back off of that log and back into the water. So ectothermic um, is the last thing that makes reptiles very special from other animals. All right, that kicks it back to you, I think, Billy, but that also kicks it back to me to pull up the slideshow. So okay. let me get to your slide. Share. Whoopsies. Sorry, folks. Billy, you are all very patient. All right. You all can see that, correct? Yes. Awesome. All right. So yeah, I yeah. wanted to start with um, with sort of the fears that people have about snakes. Um, I think this is one of the most, it's going to be the most popular phobias, but I don't know if that's really popular is the right word. Um, the most, one of the most common phobias people have, have sort of, a, often people have a deep, deep fear of snakes. Prevalent. Um, and they, it's prevalent, yes. And the, the, you know, an early idea I get across when I'm doing talks about snakes um, is that the snakes really want to have nothing to do with you. Um, they aren't trying to kill you. They are not trying to hurt you. Um, when a water snake does this kind of thing, like I got it in my hand, I promise you that the back end of it is pooping on me at the same time as its front end is, 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 is in the water snake language saying how much it wants to bite my face off. Um, it is only because I picked it up. And so uh, we really have nothing to fear from snakes um, in the sense that they're, they're not trying to do anything to you. If you don't want to deal with them, then just leave them be. Um, that's pretty easy. Uh, now, um, some snakes actually can kill you, um, even if they have really no desire to kill you. Um, and so we'll talk about a few of those really quick that I hear about. Um, sometimes people say they see a water a moccasin in Philadelphia. Um, and you might wonder, do water moccasins actually live in Philadelphia? And the answer is nope, they don't. Um, water moccasins uh, in the Eastern United States they get up to about Southern Virginia um, and that's about it. Uh, and so if someone in Philadelphia or in Pennsylvania tells you that when their uncle went fishing one time, a water moccasin crawled on his boat and this was somewhere in Berks County, they're definitely wrong. Um, uh, water moccasins do not live anywhere near us. They don't live in Wissahickon. They don't live um, in any, in the Delaware. Uh, so, you know, just don't worry about water moccasins. Um, but what about rattlesnakes? So we have rattlesnakes in Pennsylvania, right? And perhaps one time you saw some other snake and it was vibrating its tail on the leaves and it got kind of loud. Um, do rattlesnakes live in Philadelphia? Nope, still nope. Um, rattlesnakes live in Pennsylvania. Um, and so they, they live in the mountains of Pennsylvania. If you think of, if you've been dri ever driven out of Pennsylvania, out of Philadelphia and you go up the Blue Route, you go under the Lehigh Tunnel, um, or if you're going like due west and somewhere a little bit past Shippensburg, you start going through tunnels. Um, that marks the first real mountains in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, we're not gonna get too far into this, but what you might call the Ridge and Valley province of Pennsylvania. And those big ridge lines 
are the closest that rattlesnakes get to us in Pennsylvania. And on the other side, um, in New Jersey, in the Pine Barrens, we do have rattlesnakes, but still um, not anywhere actually near Philadelphia. Um, copperheads, what about copperheads? Um, so, uh, oh, I wanted to mention one more thing about the rattlesnakes. You can leave the slide there, but um, a lot of snakes will vibrate their tails in the leaf litter or on the ground um, when they're scared. Uh, and I used to think that this was having to do with imitating rattlesnakes, but it also pops up with snakes that don't live in North America. Um, so let's say I, I once had a Japanese rat snake and the Japanese rat snake would rattle its tail when it's got freaked out. Um, and so uh, it, tail rattling is something that you see a lot. It does not mean that you actually have a rattlesnake. Now, what about copperheads? Um, people say they see copperheads. A lot of snakes that we have look kind of like copperheads. Milk snakes look kind of like copperheads. Water snakes can look kind of like a copperhead. Um, but no, we don't have them in Philadelphia. Um, we do have them uh, in some areas that are closer to Philadelphia. Uh, so we have them in Valley Forge. So I think it's Mount Misery has copperheads. Um, and so if you've ever been to Valley Forge, these are hills, they're not really mountains, but um, they've got copperheads there. There are copperheads, I know in some spots in Upper Bucks County. Um, and so Philadelphia area maybe, um, but the bottom line here folks is that in Philadelphia, we have no dangerous, and I'll say dangerously venomous snakes. I'm, it's, it's a funny way to say it, but we're gonna get into why I say dangerously venomous and just not venomous and just not dangerous. Um, and as uh, Sandy pointed out before we were planning this presentation, when I say dangerous, I mean the sense that these are snakes that actually could hurt you if you put them in that position. Um, they themselves are not dangerous. Uh, I like to say, if you can see a snake, there is no way it can hurt you. Um, in the sense that you could just walk away faster than it could ever move and it's not gonna chase you anyway. It's gonna stay there or it's gonna move in the other direction. Um, so even if you're hiking and you see a rattlesnake, just back up, give it some time, it'll cross the path or you can just go around it. Um, and so um, with that in mind, let's get into some of the snakes that actually do live in Philadelphia. So we're gonna start with the most abundant, most widespread, most common, however you wanna put it, Philadelphia snake, um, and that is the brown snake. And so brown snakes uh, are sometimes called decays snake. The scientific name is Storaria decay, named after somebody named decay, um, D-E-K-A-Y. Uh, and, and if you're an iNaturalist user and you're watching this, you might have noticed that an iNaturalist, uh, that app, that um, online community, they've landed with this, the name Decay's Brown Snake. Um, and I'm not quite sure why they did it. My guess is that um, that's an app that covers the whole world. And there are other things called brown snakes elsewhere in the world. So if you get into Australia, you've got some actually sort of uh, snakes that are related to cobras that are actually pretty, danger pretty um, potently venomous. Uh, and they can get up to like seven feet long, but like the snake opposite of what brown snakes are. Um, but they, I think they just, to clarify that one is one kind of brown snake, the other is a, um, they, call, they call ours decays brown snake. But in general conversation, that's the first I ever heard anybody calling it. You can just call them a brown snake or a decay snake, you're fine. Um, brown snakes are not very big. Uh, oftentimes people will say, hey, I saw a baby garter snake. And I bet you 100% of the time they saw a brown snake. Um, they are related to garter snakes uh, and they're the, sort of the same family of snakes, even though they're in different genera, so they have a different genus. Um, but brown snakes, uh, like garter snakes and like water snakes that they're related to, uh, they kind of give birth to live young. And so this is what Sandy was starting to get into with this, this long herpetological word called ovoviviparous, it's a mouthful. Um, but what that means is, uh, I'll, I'll take a step back and say when, when an animal lays an egg, like a snake or a chicken, um, the embryo is developing inside like a, a, a sack, an amniotic sack. And actually it's, it's, it's an important definition of what, why we're not amphibians, but they have an, an amniotic sac. Um, and then on the way out, um, if you're a snake or a turtle or a chicken, um, it sort of gets layered on with additional layers that are protective. And so um, with a chicken, you have like a, a lot of calcium in there for a hard shell. Um, for a lot of snakes, it's more of a leathery finish in the end. 
Um, but what some of these snakes do, like the water snakes, the brown snakes, the garter snakes do, um, and actually even the, the, the rattlesnakes and the, the copperheads, is they sort of skip those last layers. Um, and so what comes out is, and, and, and they sort of lay the eggs when the embryos are fully developed into baby snakes that can live on their own. So what comes out is this clear sack, and then um, kind of like hatching from an egg, the baby then sort of breaks open the side of the sack and crawls out. Um, so that's a little bit of, of snake reproductive biology for you. Um, but brown snakes, um, they give birth uh, right about now. Um, and so if you are uh, looking under stuff in your garden and looking for brown snakes, maybe somewhere else, you might see these really itty bitty baby snakes. Um, in terms of the, the size of them, that as the, I put in here, that's a really big brown snake I've got in my hand right there. Um, <clears throat> they, uh, they are pretty, the, the way you find them is by looking under stuff. Um, because when you're this small, you stay out of sight to avoid getting eaten. They are on the menu for everything, for boxes and for cats and for dogs and for crows and um, hawks. And you figure even like robins will eat small brown snakes. Um, so they stay out of sight. You find them by looking under trash, debris, planters in your garden. Um, I found them, any, any object you can think of looking underneath, I think I found them underneath. Um, and they are, they are not at all harmful. They are too small to really give you any kind of a bite. Um, they can poop on you and musk on you. Uh, and so this is actually an important little thing. All snakes have musk glands um, on either side of their cloaca, which is like their general purpose opening. Um, and so they can be really stinky when they want to be. Um, and so I was just telling Sandy that since I caught, and Sandy, um, if you could stop sharing, um, we could switch back to me. Um, and uh, I think we're seeing Bob Brown, but I wanna I want folks to see me. Um, Sandy, are you seeing me? I, yes, sorry, I can see you. Okay, great. So I'm gonna show off. Um, I, I kept it in a jar since I caught it on the way home from work today. Um, a rather, whoa, now he's gonna square me. Um, a brown snake. Uh, this is a, I would call him an average sized adult male brown snake. So this guy has pretty much stopped growing. Um, right now, he does not want me to be holding him. Um, he has not pooped on me or musked on me yet, but he will if I keep holding him. Um, but you can see some basic things. One of the things you'll notice looking at him maybe is you see that he's flicking his tongue in and out. Um, snakes perceive the world in large part by smell and they have on their forked tongue, they have two branches. And so what happens is they gather um, molecules from the air and then they sort of read those molecules um, or detect them inside their mouth in a sort of a twin organ on the top of their mouth. And so they basically smell in stereo with the two forks of the tongue. Um, I'm gonna put them back because I think this is enough of a performance from this little guy who wants to be back under the cardboard box. I found them under today and I'll let him go tomorrow morning. Um, but we thank our star brown snake for his cameo appearance. Um, and we'll talk about gardener snakes. Um, so next most common prevalent in Philadelphia, abundant um, is the common garter snake, Thamnophis sertalis. Um, and so these guys are, um, are kind of like bigger versions of brown snakes. Um, that you find closer to water. Uh, garter snakes, sometimes you find them away from water for sure. By and large, they like being near water. Um, and along with uh, the kinds of, I, I did mention that the brown snakes still eat slugs and worms. So will garter snakes, but garter snakes um, will, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Sandy, garter snakes also eat things like uh, frogs and fish. Um, they have bigger heads. I like to point this out if you're ever trying to figure out what's a brown snake, what's a garter snake. Garter snakes, they're, they're in a way just because they need the bigger equipment to eat stuff that fights back. Um, so they have bigger heads. Uh, you see more greenish coloration on them. Uh, they have more prominent light striping. So a stripe down their back and then two stripes, one on each side. Uh, and that is sort of what makes a garter snake different than a brown snake. Also, they're a lot bigger. So a garter snake, um, will get over two feet long, uh, whereas a brown snake is lucky if it's longer than one foot. Um, garter snakes are pretty active. 
Uh, you can see them crawling around and basking in daylight, um, more so than you would see brown snakes. Uh, and like um, brown snakes and water snakes, the females are bigger than the males. And in the spring, you can sometimes find uh, when they're just getting out of hibernation, so like early April or so, um, you can find the females coming out and then a whole lot of males looking for the females. This is one of those. Um, this is a male that I picked up at Bartram's garden for a quick picture uh, as he was looking for love. Um, as you can tell, he did not appreciate that. Uh, and he bit me. Um, and I think, you know, with the snake that size, you're going to get maybe a couple itty bitty pinpricks. Um, and I will mention that um, they are, technically speaking, um, in some sense, venomous. Uh, garter snakes, water snakes, um, a lot of snakes, it turns out, have, uh, have some of the chemicals that in a rattlesnake would make up venom, in, ven sorry, would make up venom, but just in their saliva. Um, and garter snakes actually have slightly larger teeth towards the back of their upper jaw. Um, so that, let's say, if they're chewing on a frog, um, they might make the frog feel kind of woozy. Um, and sort of that could be, that, that maybe drop its blood pressure a little bit. That's the kind of thing that might give it an advantage in overpowering the frog. And you can see how that kind of thing evolves over time with some lineages of snakes into the venom that we see like in rattlesnakes that um, you know, the sort of, they get a little bit more potent venom, a little bit more potent, and then more, uh, more, let's say, sophisticated um, or more dedicated delivery mechanisms like fangs. Um, but garter snakes are sort of way at the base of that evolutionary path, uh, and so are not actually dangerous at all to us. Um, luckily, I am not a toad um, for many reasons. All right, so next up, I mentioned the relatives of water snakes. I took a picture this is how you actually might see them a lot of the time is you kind of see the snake swimming through the water. If you look carefully, you can see the pattern, but what you notice is it's swimming. Um, this one is from Cobbs Creek. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, we've got a couple of what are more action shots with water snakes. People will sometimes say things like, this is an aggressive snake. Uh, and I always like to point out, no, it's not. Um, it is a defensive snake. It is a snake standing up for itself. Um, I have picked that snake up. It is has a, you know, most of the time when a snake gets picked up by something bigger, it's about to die. Um, it's about to get eaten by a heron or a raccoon or who knows what. Um, so this snake is very actively defending itself. Um, <clears throat> again, these are not water moccasins, but you can see how people could get confused. Um, they do their best to look fatter and wider and bigger and scarier, including flattening their heads. Um, and so uh, maybe there is some evolutionary uh, mimicry going on, like they evolved some mimicry of water, of, of water moccasins, who knows, but a lot of snakes around the world um, try to make themselves look bigger and scarier um, and to, to scare away predators. Um, I like to say that water, water snakes, they actually bite pretty hard um, and can draw not like blood running down your hand, but like a few drops of it for sure. Um, and it kind of hurts. Uh, and they can poop with the best of them. So uh, you, 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 wanna, you wanna be really sure you wanna pick up that water snake when you go pick up that water snake uh, because they're gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna fight back. Um, and I'll also point out that, uh, again, they give birth to live young. As you imagine, can imagine, they eat fish, they eat frogs, they eat things you can find around the water. You don't usually find them very far from water at all. They really live up to their name. All right, we're gonna get a little more obscure with the next snake as we do our tour of snakes of Philadelphia. Um, we've got this little cutie, it's a ring neck snake. That guy right there is about full grown. They can get maybe a little bigger than that, but that's about it. Um, they only, in Philadelphia, they only live uh, in, um, or I have only heard of them being found in, uh, in around the Wissahickon, um, I found one in Cobbs Creek, um, or at the edge of Cobbs Creek in the Haddington Woods section in an old quarry that I keep meaning to get back to, but it's gotten very overgrown, I haven't had a chance. Um, and then a friend of mine uh, just posted one on, on iNaturalist uh, in Fairmount Park West. Um, so this is a snake that does not come out in the open very much. You sort of have to go find it by looking under stuff. Um, they, you know, we had we're on a, a run of, of live or ovoviviparous snakes. This one's just straight up ovoviparous, so it just lays eggs. 
Um, they mostly eat salamanders uh, and there's a lot of salamanders in the woods in Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, we've got, these are actually, I think they're quite pretty, you know, bright yellow coloration, nice little ring around their neck. Um, but when you get out west into California, um, in the desert southwest, you get them with like bright orange bellies, a little bit bigger snakes, really neat snakes. It's a shame we don't have more of them in Philadelphia. We have uh, but in, in Roxborough. In Roxborough, yes. Yeah. So Northwest Philly. Yeah. Um, and and mostly in our house. Mostly in our house, yes. <laughs> there you go. This is what I knew was going to happen, Dave. I was going to get to the point where... <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there, Bernard. Oh, that's, that's great. It's, no, it's perfect. Um, and I think there's a little dot on the map when I look at it. I, I, in the background, I put the iNaturalist uh, maps. Um, there's a little dot on there that I think is Roxborough. Um, but uh, please do... Um, if you, we're going to get to this later. Um, this is a snake that I really want people to post on iNaturalist if you find them, um, because I think there's more of them out there. They're just not getting documented and they're, they're, they're easy, it's easier for them to, to escape notice. Um, so go flip some rocks, see if you can find them. Next up, in the same theme, really, um, although bigger and just a, just a fabulous snake, this is a milk snake, which I think, Dave, you also have in your yard. Yes, we have them in this area between Shama and Port Royal. Uh, people see them all the time. Yeah. Uh, so, and I actually found a whole nest, not a nest of them, but a whole bunch of them together. Oh, man, you're killing me. All right, I, 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 I spent, um, I'll get into this in a minute, but I'll, let me start with the introduction of them. These are, um, these are, unlike all the snakes I just talked about, these snakes kill their prey by constriction. Um, so you might hear about this with boa constrictors, um, and milk snakes are part of a group of snakes called king snakes um, when they catch their prey. And so for baby milk snakes, that prey is um, smaller snakes for the most part. Um, for adult milk snakes, they go through a shift in their life to eat bigger, warmer things. So adult milk snakes mainly eat rodents um, and they overpower them. They kill them by grabbing them and throwing a few coils around them and squeezing really hard. Um, and part of it is stopping them from breathing, but what's really happening probably is that they're cutting off blood circulation. Um, and uh, in some cases, maybe just breaking their necks while they constrict uh, you know, a mouse or a vole or a shrew or something like that. Um, and so milk snakes are also a snake that we don't seem to find much outside of Northwest Philadelphia. Um, so Roxborough area, like Dave was talking about, the Wissahickon, um, although, uh, someone just put one on a naturalist near the East Park Reservoir in East Park. And so I think this is a snake that, that remains to be found more in Philadelphia. Um, they stay out of sight. Um, you tend to find them under things if you find them. Um, I found one in 2005. It took me about 10 years to find my next one. Um, and we can go to that next slide. Uh, and these are a snake that goes through... Um, a bit of a, uh, a, a shift in pattern as they grow. They start off as um, more brightly colored babies after they hatch out of the egg. Um, and so here you've got one that's a relatively recent hatchling um, and the one on the previous slide, full grown, still looking pretty nice. Um, I like to say that, to point out that in Philadelphia, we have some really nice looking milk snakes. I'm not sure if everyone is proud of that as much as I am. Um, but, but if you look at milk snakes elsewhere in Pennsylvania, they look kind of dingy by comparison. So we should be proud of our milk snakes. Um, elsewhere, these are a classic snake of old agricultural landscapes. Um, your sort of typical way to find a milk snake is going to an old barn somewhere and start looking under boards around the old barn. Um, anybody know, uh, and we've only got a few people on the call, I know, but anybody want to volunteer why milk snakes are called milk snakes? What the heck do they have to do with milk? Feel free to put it in the chat or not. I'm going to give it a few seconds and then I'll just tell you. Um, all right, I don't see any guesses, so I'm going to go ahead and explain. Uh, so milk snakes, they drink milk. That's a good guess, Christina, but um, in reality, um, no snakes actually drink milk. And the, in the, the idea of it was that um, they are often found in barns with cows. Um, and that is because in barns with cows, there's a lot of grain that gets spilled on the ground. Um, exactly, a myth. Uh, and so 
farmers would associate these snakes with being around their cows. And so you end up with this myth that they would suck the milk out of the udders, which is definitely not true. Um, I want to say this is like getting kind of into obscure stuff, but I was reading um, the, an old naturalist um, who had explored the Philadelphia area, Swedish guy, or Finnish Swedish guy um, named Peter Kalm. Uh, and he had, he had done this in the mid 1700s, um, early mid 1700s. And he wrote about the myth of what I think what he was talking about were black rat snakes sucking milk out of cows. So I wonder if this was like a more common myth about does any snakes that happen to be in barns. And this is the one where the name really stuck. Um, so these are, um, I'll say really quick, these guys are, uh, they're, um, they're not common in Philadelphia, probably or they're widespread in some areas of Philadelphia, but not in others, I think, mainly because they get killed crossing the road. This is going to be a theme. Um, big snakes do not cross roads very well. Um, they're just not fast enough to get across. Uh, and in other ways, roads can just be barriers to their movement. Um, so let's get to another snake that doesn't cross roads very well. Um, the black racer. <laughs> so um, this is one that if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said, um, they don't live here. Um, then a guy I know who is another herper said he saw one and took a picture under I-95 in FDR Park near the skate park. Um, and so he had a picture, so <laughs> there was no arguing with it. And also I, I know him, he's a, he knows what he's looking at. Um, someone else told me once that they saw one in Cobbs Creek, which is plausible. Um, if we think of the lay of the land, Cobbs Creek, um, is you know up the road from the John Hines National Wildlife Refuge, which really is part of a habitat sort of area along with FDR Park um, along the river there. Uh, so it's it's you know conceivable, um, but then uh, you know we all started carrying around these little computer camera things in our pockets all the time, um, and combined with iNaturalist, uh, observations started coming in for these guys from uh, northeast Philly along the waterfront. Um, and so I had caught one, uh, well, yeah, I'm not gonna go into this too much detail, but yeah, so they seem to be a little bit more widespread than I thought they were. And there was one weird rec record that came in from West Philly, but I still haven't figured that one out. Um, they hatch out with a strong blotched pattern um, and then change over time into a very even dark, um, kind of glossy, dark gray black color with a little white on their chin. Um, now, of course, no snake actually wants to kill you. We already talked about this, but this snake looks like it wants to kill you. Um, they have like a, a little bit of a raised scale above their eye that just gives them this angry, what I call a murderous glare. They want to they pick one up and it want, you, you know it wants to bite your face off. Um, even though it can't, it's not venomous, it's not gonna hurt you really. Um, they can bite pretty hard, but they just sell it. They're just, they just are tough snakes. Um, they do not constrict. We just talked about milk snakes being constrictors. Racers basically kill things by um, having a really strong mouth and just like, honestly, like beating it around. We'll just grab something and just like shake it really hard like a dog would. Um, and eventually whatever they're trying to eat is so worn out, they just swallow it. Um, and if you can catch one, uh, be ready for for something to bite back. Again, like the water snake, it's gonna draw a little bit of blood. It's not gonna kill you or anything. I, I always rank these behind a cat scratch in um, injury severity. So if you've ever had a cat that scratched you when it was on your lap and you're trying to jump it off you or something, um, that's worse than any of these snakes can do to you. Um, but they are neat snakes. Again, please take pictures of them if you see them because um, I wanna learn more about where they live. Um, next up, um, in our last of our snakes that actually live in Philadelphia, um, we've got black rat snakes. Um, again, you know, 10 years ago, I was arguing with people and telling them, like, for sure, these guys do not live in Philadelphia. No way that they live in Philadelphia. I was definitely wrong. Um, they, uh, I've seen them now, well, I've seen pictures of them from uh, along the Delaware waterfront, both in Northeast Philly in the parks there, as well as near, let's say, Washington Avenue Green on the southern stretch of the Delaware waterfront. Um, I've seen pictures of them from Bartram's Garden, FDR Park. Um, they just, they, they're popping up more and more in big green spaces around the city. 
Um, I saw one at the school kill center back in the power line cut there once. So they are around more than I would have even given them credit for. Um, and there was one odd sighting on iNaturalist in the Fairmount neighborhood. I still want to figure that one out. And I, I would love to learn more about that. Um, these guys, we'll go to the next slide. Um, these guys had what I just think is one of the most fabulous defensive displays of any snake. They sort of do this, this like zigzag stacked coil thing when they're freaked out um, and look really impressive. Uh, I'll say that they could probably, you know, bite you like a racer would, but um, they are more mellow snakes in general. Um, they're pretty, there's always one that's going to be the exception, but um, with rat snakes, if you're gentle picking them up, they generally calm down pretty quickly and don't try to bite you or poop on you much. Um, not that you should pick them up if you don't want to, by all means, let them go, take a good picture, that can be fine. Um, but if you do wanna, if you get into picking up snakes, um, black rat snakes are a pleasure. Uh, they are constrictors just like the milk snakes. Um, they start off eating warm blooded prey. So the babies, which are not very big and you can see that they have a strong blotch pattern when they're babies. They'll eat baby mice, um, they'll eat baby birds. And then as they get a little bit bigger, they'll, they'll graduate to bigger mice and so on. And the adults will take squirrels and uh, probably small rabbits and things like that. And plenty of birds too. They are very good climbers. Um, you can even see it in this picture. I should have zoomed in somehow, but um, in the photograph of the one that's, that's in the defensive zigzag there, you can see kind of how the belly scales have a bit of an edge along the side um, that helps them grip and climb rough surfaces like tree bark. Uh, they also have wi a wide belly. So in cross, if you were to, if you were not going to do this, but if you're going to cut one right across, um, its cross section would be kind of like a loaf of bread. Um, whereas a, a, a eraser would be like a perfect circle. It'd be more like a cylinder. Um, I think that is the stuff that I wanted to cover right there. Um, they are egg layers. And I want to do a quick slide because um, how do they fit squirrels in their mouth? Exploding head? Good question. Um, so something we actually didn't touch on yet, <clears throat> which is how the heck do snakes fit big things in a small mouth? Um, and the answer is that they can basically dislocate their jaws. Uh, and there's a few other adaptations involved too. They can sort of stick their windpipe out a little bit so they can keep on breathing. Um, and then with those dislocated jaws, they have very flexible, stretchy ligaments. Um, that can stretch out pretty far. So they kind of like walk their jaws around what it is they're swallowing. Um, and so a black rat snake can eat something that is several times wider than its head. Um, might take them a while, uh, but they'll get it down. Um, and then this stuff I think is talked about less often, but they also have adaptations to help them digest big things in a hurry. Um, so you know, what happens inside a snake is that for most of the time, its digestive system isn't doing much and it's, it's kind of sort of in, you know, dormant. And then all of a sudden, it's going to eat something that might weigh its, as much as it does or a good percentage of it. So let's say half its body weight. Um, you know, I, would, I can't imagine eating something that's 90 pounds, but that's what we're talking about for my scale. Um, and so all of a sudden, their digestive system switches on and digests an enormous meal in just a few days. Um, it could be maybe a week, but still it's an amazing feat of metabolism and digestion along with what's amazing about how they swallow them. Um, so it's fun stuff. Good question there, Christina. Um, so <clears throat> I wanted to, let's go back and compare um, rat snakes to racers again real quick because a lot of times people see a quote black snake, which is totally understandable. You see it quickly, you're not sure what it is. People just have, have grown to call these both just black snakes. Um, but there are some differences you can learn to recognize. Um, I like to point out that the black rat snakes usually have a little bit of that blotched pattern left underneath sort of darker coloration. So you can see a little bit of pattern showing through. Um, whereas the racers are just this perfect, even um, black color. Uh, the racers, again, have more of a cylindrical body. Um, the, the rat snakes have a wider belly, um, and so it gives them more of a, a loaf of bread cross section. Um, if you look closely to rat snake, you can see that it's, some of its scales are keeled. This is a term we didn't get into, but especially when you look, we're not going to go back there, but if you think about the garter snakes and the water snakes we looked at and the brown snake, 
um, those have kind of a rough feel to their scales. They have a little ridge down each scale. Um, other snakes like the ringneck snake or the milk snake, or in this case, um, the racer, have really smooth scales. Um, and rat snakes are kind of in between. Um, I think racers have slightly bigger looking eyes. Um, again, I, you know, I, I joke about this. They have the, that look that they want to kill you. Um, whereas rat snakes, just for whatever reason, the way humans interpret them, they have a more inquisitive look or inquisitive vibe to them. And the last thing is how they behave when you see them. Um, rat snakes are less quick to, to just get the heck out of there. Um, they'll slide away for sure. They'll often climb a tree. Um, and so, you know, the, and they're really good at climbing. Racers will sometimes climb, but they tend to stick to the ground. They tend to be out of there like a bat out of hell. They just like, bam, they're gone. Um, and if, you're, if you see a black snake and before you had a chance to look at it good, it's out of there. Um, that's a racer. And that's how they got their name. They're just super fast um, and super quick at getting away. Um, and so that is the end of our tour of the snakes of Philadelphia. It's pretty much all the snakes we got. Um, Sandy, would you like to trade slideshows again? I should unmute before I do any of that. Yes, let's. Okay. Oh, golly. Now I'm putting the wrong slides up. Okay. So now we are going to get a little bit into what to do if you see a snake, how to kind of take care of them, um, how to conserve them. So what to do if you see a snake or you wish to see one? Well, number one, as we've kind of gone over, especially with those milk snakes and those ring necks is document, document, document. And in our world, it's citizen science, citizen science, citizen science. So you're going to document any snakes you find, in particular, those two milk snakes and ring neck snakes um, to um, iNaturalist, as we saw on the slideshow. But there's another organization called PARS, which stands for the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey. Um, so you can use the PARS website. There's also a PARS app. And in so iNaturalist, be, yes? Really quick. Please. I'm, we are not seeing the slide. Oh, I thought you put it up. Oh, I I'm thought, sorry. oh, I'm sorry. I'm doing it. Never mind. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry, guys. That was a no. total silly. Put it on me. I just got back from vacation. No, 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 vacation no, no, brain. No, 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 no. We okay. should have. <laughs> We're going to zip through this, guys. I apologize for this communication hiccup. No, nope, um, it's blame it on me. There we go. All right. I take responsibility. I awesome. Refuse to. There you go. There you go. <laughs> So again, PARS website, there's a PARS app um, or on iNaturalist, there's also a PARS project. Um, iNaturalist is obviously the other one that we encourage you to use often, um, especially when it comes to April and May when we do the City Nature Challenge. Um, so there is an iNaturalist website, uh, iNaturalist app um, for those uh, with younger children um, or maybe new to it. There is a version of the iNaturalist app called Seek, um, which is a little bit more like a Pokemon Go type app, but you can sync that with iNaturalist as well. Um, but they're all really great resources to begin your, you know, love of identifying the living things around you in a fun way and really to, um, to help the world out with citizen science and help us identify what you see and um, help conserve them as well. Um, so next slide. Okay. So this may seem like a curious one, get a fishing license. Um, so actually the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission is responsible for managing um, herps, which is a collective term that includes both reptiles and amphibians. Um, so a valid fishing license is actually required for anyone who wants to catch and that, that literally does mean picking up one under a rock or, you know, on a log next to a stream um, or, you know, catching or taking any herps from Commonwealth waterways. So you do need to go get your fishing license to go out and look for reptiles and amphibians. Um, next slide. Ooh, I'm squeaky from vacation. <laughs> I'm just throwing really quick that the, fishing, the, the money from Fish and Boat Commission also pays for citizen science and conservation efforts like, like PARS. Um, and so the money isn't just going to some fish hatchery somewhere, it's also going to help uh, the, the reptile and amphibian stuff that we care a lot about. Thank you, really. That was very appreciated. So most importantly, how can you help? How can you hate, help snakes? You can support snakes mainly 
um, sort of the cliff note of what we're going to go over is plant native species and create wildlife habitat. Um, sort of as you see to the left, and as we talked a little bit about, or as I talked a little bit about in the introduction, um, my the garden next door, which is the nonprofit umbrella that holds in uh, the Nature Heroes and PhillyNature.org, um, was created to do just that, um, to help the whole food chain um, and help wildlife in a habitat that they can thrive and survive. So you can do that too by doing wildlife habitat gardening, uh, make your home wildlife friendly. Um, you know, the snakes that we saw not only are beautiful and, and intriguing as we've learned a lot about them, but they also make great neighbors. Um, so all snakes do deserve our respect and you can attract them pretty easily. Um, if you really want and value the presence of a snake in your garden, um, you can attract your very own, as I like to call it, garden bouncer or mouse hunter um, by providing lovely snake habitat. So first and foremost, snakes all need a place to hide. Um, you can provide shelter by using an old piece of plywood, um, old wood, old stumps. Um, a really good one a lot of folks like to use is if you have an old piece of sort of metal, a metal roofing panel or something like that, that kind of warms up. We talked about them being ectothermic. Um, virtually anything that provides a safe place for the snake works well. Um, natural leaf litter, fallen branches also provide productive snake habitat. Um, additionally, the snakes, like all animals, need a source of water. Um, so, you know, ground level bird bath type thing, small shallow fountain will do the trick, um, especially if the water is clean and accessible. Um, any other moist areas like, you know, rain gardens will also help snakes take a drink or cool off. Um, want you to remember though, in, in providing all of this really lovely snake and really animal habitat in general, it's, it's pretty versatile, is you wanna reduce the chance of sort of accidentally killing your new snake friends. So if you are taking care of your garden in a way that um, requires some potential weed whacking or mowing, um, you do wanna sort of walk the areas that you're about to do that in search of snakes because snakes can become um, victims of lawn mowing and it has happened often. So uh, most of the time, if you do take that walk around, any snakes will retreat to their hiding place if they hear you coming. Um, I want to add to that as well, that if for some reason you are becoming, you're in your beginning steps of your journey and becoming more comfortable with snakes, um, and maybe you don't want snakes in your yard, um, just don't provide these things and it won't be great snake habitat and they'll kind of move on to the next snake habitat. So it's a, it's a great alternative to perhaps trying to rid them in other less humane ways. So if you don't want snakes, don't put the habitat stuff in, but we recommend creating snake habitat. Um, another thing that's really, really important is to really try to use less or none at all when it comes to herbicides and pesticides. Um, so again, back to attracting snakes, it means no chemicals. If you eliminate the use of harmful chemicals in your garden, um, it will not, it, so the, the herbicides and the pesticides can actually harm all wildlife on all levels of the food chain. Um, and a lot of times when they're in your garden, they take a long time to degrade in an ecosystem. They can build up in the soils, which means, you know, they can be in the food chain for, for quite a long time. Um, so when you have predators such as snakes and even birds, um, when they're eating poisoned animals that have maybe eaten the, the, the foods that have had the poison on them or herbicides on them or the pesticides went in the sake of the, the uh, mice and things like that, it will make its way up to the food chain and harm snakes. So please no herbicides, no pesticides if you can avoid it or use it very um, sparingly and the way you should on the label. Um, one other thing that can be really helpful for snakes and other things in your garden and otherwise is to just, you know, like we're doing tonight, learn more about the snakes in your area and share that excitement. We talked about the documentation, um, learn about how interesting and important they are and how they play such an integral role in the ecosystem. They do, like I said, control rodent populations. Um, so just like we're doing tonight, familiar, familiarize yourself with local snakes and share that with others. Um, one of the things that I love to do when working with young ones is finding one or two cool snake facts to make them um, a little less scary for folks. And Billy alluded to one of them is that, you know, the snakes sort of smelling with their tongue and using that Jacobson's organ to sort of smell in stereo in the two different ways. Um, and the other fun one we didn't really touch on, I like to talk about is um, when we talked about the tuatara and the lizard having the, the eardrums or the ex sort of external ear holes, snakes don't have that at all. Um, so I like to joke around and say snakes kind of, they hear with their bellies or they kind of sense and feel vibration. So, you know, sharing those sort of fun snake facts with others really helps um, 
to share how wonderful they are and encourage others to be sort of serious nature heroes about protecting wildlife species and creating wildlife habitat. Um, I do want to get into, I don't know, Billy, if you want to forward along, I think we have the, yes. Um, so this one I know is kind of graphic and I, and I, I don't want to end on this one. So I do want to go back after that to one that might be happy again. Um, but going to get into this a little slowly. So I want everybody to think about too, when it comes to sort of saving snakes and protecting them with wildlife habitat and wildlife gardening is um, when you're doing so sort of consume less and recycle more. So trash in general, before we get into the netting, isn't just ugly, it's dangerous. So outside of even this netting, as you see here, snakes, birds, and other animals can trap their bodies very easily in plastic. Um, so you know, the trash, the plastics that you sort of see re really pollutes everyone's natural resources. So um, I want to encourage everyone to have, you know, in their best way possible, try to minimize your effect on the environment. Um, you know, it used to be the three R's. Now I like to say the five. So refuse. So refuse it if you don't need it. Um, reduce your use, obviously. Reuse if you can. Recycle and rot. So compost. Um, it's a really great way to kind of keep some of these things that are really dangerous and um, harmful sort of out of our ecosystem in the first place. So consuming less is an incredibly efficient way to protect animals such as snakes. And as you see here, please do not use the plastic mess stuff. Um, as this is actually uh, at a local park in Philadelphia and uh, well, well intentioned, they use the sort of bird netting to keep some, um, freshly planted garden safe from birds. And it did just the opposite. We, that we actually, as you can see here, there was a black racer that was harmed or and killed actually in the netting. So please, please, please get rid of the netting. Don't use it. Don't use the plastic, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't want to end on just something big and scary. So I want to skip back to just, again, when you can um, restore and protect snake habitat. It's really critical for not only snakes, but all wildlife. Um, so really help to reduce that habitat loss, um, help to ensure that animals such as snakes have a nice place that they can find their food, water, and shelter. Plant native trees, plant native plants, try to restore natural, um, natural areas, wetland areas. Um, you can help clean up local areas as well. So help snakes. They're really great, I promise. Um, Billy, I believe this is going to kick it back to you again. Um, so I am going to. Sandy, I can just take it from my end with the slideshow. I, I think <clears throat> it's just a few slides. I'll be fine. So let's. You're so good. Well, thank you. We don't have to do the switching back and forth. Cool. Um, that's uh, so here for the home stretch. Um, I like to say also, uh, <clears throat> I'll start with a story that, um, that I it must have been like 11 or 12 years ago. Um, I had. Uh, someone was asking me what kind of snake her cat had caught and brought in. Um, it was the fifth one. The other four had died from the cat killing them. Um, and so uh, that was my introduction to um, how, how cats uh, actually do kill, seem to kill a lot of snakes. Um, and it's something that, you know, cats get more attention for killing birds. That's an important conservation issue. Um, but uh, sort of just by being cats, they're into playing with little things that move. Um, and whether, you know, you've got a fake mouse on the end of a string that you're bouncing up and down or a laser pointer with a dot, um, you know, if they see a little snake moving around, they're gonna play with that, maybe play with it until it stops moving. Um, and so uh, one great way to, to help a lot of the small animals that live around us is keep cats inside. Um, and if you take them outside, there's a great ways to keep, take your cat outside. This is a picture of my friend Naveen um, his cat, which he takes out on a leash. Um, it isn't like walking a dog. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't necessarily walk around the block and sniff everything, but it gets outside. It has a good time. Um, and uh, the cat, A, the cat stays safe. It's not going to get run over by a car. Um, and you can keep an eye on the cat so it doesn't kill other things while you're out there. Um, so it's another good way to help the snakes. Uh, and we're going to wind up with something big. Uh, <clears throat> this is not practical right now. Um, but when I think of what is the biggest thing that limits where snakes can live and that kill snakes in, in Philadelphia or any really any urbanized area, it's roads. <laughs> and we don't think of it. We, we sort of take roads for granted. Um, but we forget that if you are a small, relatively slow moving animal, um, like a snake, uh, a road is, is an incredible barrier. First of all, um, you've probably evolved to be 
really concerned about getting eaten by a bird coming from above. Um, so if you're, you know, a brown snake, again, it could be like a robin or a mockingbird. It doesn't have to be a very big bird. Um, whereas, you know, with the rat snake, that might be a red-tailed hawk or something like that. Um, but all of them avoid being out in the open at almost all costs. Um, and so crawling across like a 15, 20 foot ride road or a multi-lane road is just scary to even contemplate. They avoid them. You, when they put transmitters on snakes, there's a lot of this, you'll see a snake go right up to a road and then turn and go along it and then not cross. It. They'll do everything they can to avoid crossing roads. When they do cross roads, they get run over. Um, this is, you know, it's a, it's a, one of the things that herpers like to do is to drive around on roads and see if they find snakes crossing. Um, you do this out in the countryside. Again, every snake you see crossing is probably 10 more that didn't even bother trying, but sometimes they do. Um, and when you're out there, a lot of times you find dead snakes on the road, the ones that tried to cross and didn't make it because cars are big and, and faster and heavier and more powerful than the snake. Um, and also drivers a lot of times swerve out of their way to kill snakes when they see them. Um, not a lot of drivers, but let's say if you've got a busy road, you just need one driver out of a hundred um, and that snake's not gonna make it across. Uh, and so um, this is a big visioning thing, like how could we have our world of people packed in pretty densely without these big asphalt wildlife death traps. Um, and you know, some people come up with some inventive things like in, uh, actually in Dave's neck of the woods in Roxborough, you've got the toad crossing project, which focuses on um, how to keep uh, so many toads in breeding season getting killed like around the East Park Reservoir. Um, and uh, you know, I, I would encourage this kind of thinking there, there's, um, I just thought of a snake example. There's a famous uh, wildlife area, park area. Um, I think it's in Southern Illinois. It's actually called Snake Road. Um, it goes along some cliffs or some bluffs, which are a popular hibernation spot. It's got some marshes on the other side. They actually close that road down for parts of the year so that um, snakes don't get run over so much. Um, but yeah, this is something to sort of, as we think of a future city that was more friendly to wildlife, um, at some point we got to figure out the road situation. Um, but that is it. Um, I think these are some big takeaways, some things that you can act on sooner, some things that are longer term, uh, big ideas. Um, but we are happy to, you know, we only got a couple of people at this point, um, but we are happy to take questions that we've got. So, um, and also I'll put in a pitch right here phillynature.org for more information on Philly wildlife, including snakes. Um, and if you're watching this live, you're watching this as a recording uh, on YouTube. Um, please don't hesitate to donate to philly phillynature.org um, to support more programming like this. Uh, so, hey, any questions? Go for it. Billy, I'll kick it off with one that I've heard often and would love your thoughts on. Go for um, it. Uh, it has been said, or I have heard that when, you know, we talked a little bit about, say, the uh, the water snakes and the rat snakes, the black rats, um, oh, sorry, the racers, sorry, the water snakes and the racers being sort of bigger biters. Now, I have heard that that can sometimes relate to their preferred prey items. So in other words, water snakes are going to be going after fish that tend to be a little bit faster when it comes to the catch and conversely racers and maybe even black rats, you know, maybe catching things like even a bird or something that might be faster. So they tend to be a little bit bitier because they're just naturally going after prey items that they have to kind of be faster and harder when striking at. Have you heard that or, you know, I have not heard your that. thoughts. Okay. Yeah. Fair my enough. initial thoughts are that they're, they are snakes that, that use their mouths to overpower their prey. Um, <clears throat> so that they have really st just stronger jaws and stronger teeth because of that. Um, and so if, uh, you know, a rat snake, I've been bitten by rat snakes, it's not fun, um, no. but I think of them as not being quite as, they, I just haven't had them chew on me quite the same way a racer does. Um, and I think part of it is just rat snakes, they don't really kill with their mouths. They sort of their mouths hold something while they kill with the rest of their body, right? Um, and so, uh, whereas a racer and a water snake, you know, they're really, their mouth is the thing that they use to, 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 to get their prey to stop squirming and go down their throat. 
which is another way of saying kill them or overpower them. I think they just have just more powerful mouths because that's my that's my interpretation. I don't think I've got any hard science behind that. Fair enough. Christina took, typed in the chat at the Wissahickon Environmental Center in a food forest. There was an empty beehive that I would find giant her milk snakes and then one time a giant garter. Very that cool. is awesome. It is very cool. And it's um, actually that's one spot in the city where you can where I, I was about to say you can regularly find milk snakes. I think Christina has, I don't know, I would guess you have um, the, now they're two giant garters. Um, I bet that you probably see milk snakes maybe like what 10 times a year. Um, but like to me, that seems like all the time, but you're there almost all the like every day, most of the year. Um, so even with that, those kind of like, if you think about it, like your your number of days, number of milk snakes per day is pretty low. Um, and so they're just one of these snakes where um, sometimes you see them, sometimes you, well, most of the time you don't. Um, I have a friend who lives in Mount Airy, not too far from the Wissahickon. And he had three milk snakes in his yard. Um, I don't think he'd seen them before, but he had one, it was, I guess, two males pursuing a female. I'm sure I set them up there behind boxes. You know, and that's actually, Christina, it's a funny question because um, it's a, if you want to find them more, then yes, put out more things to look underneath. Mm. Um, it's sort of like, it's an interesting question. Um, Sandy talked about it a little bit. Um, it's sort of a, it's, do we find snakes under cover objects because snakes like cover objects or because cover objects are easy for us to look under? Um, and so the, it, it's, it's a kind of, a, it gets to a question of like observation bias. Um, but, uh, but a lot of herpers, you know, regular practice is to quote, lay a board line um, and what that means is go out there and put out cover like hive boxes you know, or just old boards. Um, and then later on, you can look underneath them and find snakes. So it's a, so I, heck yeah, I would. Yeah. <laughs> I got, Christina, I got two old doors that I salvaged once because I meant to put them out somewhere else to look for milk snakes. They're still in my basement um, because I found doors to be really nice cover objects. Um, but, you know, so yeah, I'd, I'd say, go, heck yeah, put down some boards, see what you find. Uh, cool. Dave, you got any stories or any questions? Um, well, I'll throw, I wanted to throw one observation at. In, in the early spring on our back hill where the sun's hitting it, I noticed the hawks are hunting that hill for snakes. So on a regular basis, yeah. the snakes are out there, they're a little sluggish. Um, or at least I theorize that's what's happening and they're just haven't quite got off, quite gotten into like full mode yet. And the hawks yeah. pick them off left and right. Um, I think this is a big thing with garter snakes. Um, I have more than once been driving or walking around the city. I see either a, a, a red shouldered hawk or a red tail hawk with a garter snake and its claws or its talons. Um, I mean, near the Cobbs Creek Environmental Center one time, I was talking to, to, to my friend Tony, who runs the center in the driveway, and we watched a hawk just sort of jump off of a tree branch and grab a garter snake that was just emerging um, from what I guess was the spot where it hibernated. Um, so yeah, it's super calm. It is something you see, you know, in the spring, um, especially there's not a whole lot of leaf cover. Uh, and so they don't have a, maybe some of the ways that they would normally be screened from view from above. Right. Um, and they're a little sluggish and they're looking for love. So they might not be focusing so much on, on staying safe from predators. Um, and so they're just not paying as much attention, you know, cause they're focused on something else. Um, and so for a bunch of reasons, yeah, early spring, um, just want to start and warm up. Uh, a lot of my snake observations are hawk observations. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And it's all, it makes me a little sad. Like I'm always rooting for the snake, but I understand, you know, this is, um, this is the nature is not pretty, right? You know, and, and snakes are solidly in the middle of the food chain for the most part. We have seen some uh, baby box turtles this year. Oh, uh, Dave, you don't know how special that is. Yeah. Um, maybe you do know. I'll say to everybody else why that's special. Uh, we had a presentation. Go back and watch our presentation on box turtles. Um, and in that, you'll, you'll, you'll see that everybody's watching us on YouTube. Um, you'll see that uh, we talk about how box turtles um, 
even when a population is in decline, you still might have a few adults hanging around being found. Um, and that doesn't mean you have a healthy population, right? You know you have a healthy population of box turtles when you see babies, um, because it means that the, man, the adults are, are bumping into each other and you know, doing their thing and making babies. Um, and uh, you, you've got, um, that's, this, that's just really fun news. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's just, I've seen babies at, from some parts of the Wissahickon. I'll be cagey about exactly where, because I like to, um, to we're not gonna tell anyone what Dave's address is, um, but you know, we sh I don't wanna have people looking for box turtles in particular places, but, um, but there are some, there are a few spots, not a lot, um, but when I hear about baby box turtles, it gets me really happy. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so I think we can pretty much wrap it up. Um, this is a you know hour and fifteen minutes is a long thing to watch on YouTube anyhow. Um, and we appreciate uh, Dave for sticking with us throughout and Christina yeah. tuning in. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, I don't think we haven't we don't know yet what our next presentation is going to be, but um, Sandy and I. We, we talk, we have ideas, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll jump on something. Um, and I'll mention also, uh, we also repost videos that we do in partnership with Grid Magazine. So a whole series of nature videos. Um, thank you. And we'll say goodbye to my little friend here who <laughs> made his appearance earlier. I grabbed him from a vacant lot in West Philly on the way to work tomorrow. I'll drop him back off in the vacant lot. Um, this is one of my favorite tricks with doing walks. A lot of times when you're leading a nature walk, you don't know if you're going to find anything, right? But if you go ahead of time, catch something to have in a jar, and then you can like let it go later, um, people can see a live animal. Um, and so this guy, keep him overnight, it's fine. Um, and he'll be okay in the morning. And I'll say, I have a fishing license. The legal limit of catching brown snakes is one, got one. Um, so this is all, and this is not captured in a place with any kind of collection ban, like a city park. Um, so... Uh, be careful, watch, you know, learn the laws if you want to try to catch them um, and do this kind of thing. Keep them for a night, get a good look at them and let them go in the morning. Um, so thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sandy. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Mark. thanks for coming. And yeah, then, hey, we really Sandy, enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Sandy, when, Dave, can you hang on for a second after Sandy stops recording? I got to tell you something really quick. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I can do that right now. I'll just hit.